John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. It's always good to be with you. Um, I know the three of us have been traveling, and we won't bore the audience as to what we were doing and where we were, but John and I will talk about our attendance at the Living Legends of Aviation event that recently took place, and we'll do that in a different show. But we want to get back into part two of a show that we've been doing regarding the Jenny Rivera accident and the Lear 25 that crashed in Mexico. A number of things that uh, have come up in this accident over the years that don't seem to go away, kind of like TWA 800, are the conspiracy theories or the potential for conspiracy theories versus factual information. Todd, I know you've done a lot of research on this accident. You've, uh, you know, gone through the report. You've looked at other sources. Um, you put a little cheat sheet together for, for John and I. And I'm just going to let you take it with this whole discussion about conspiracy theories. Because, again, you have a famous lady. Um, she is a rising star. And, of course, when you have people like this who are on the ladder going up, there are always people trying to knock the pegs out from underneath that ladder, uh, whether it's petty jealousy or some other reason. So why don't we talk about conspiracy theories? Well, conspiracy theories are popular when it comes to uh, major airline accidents, and in this case with Jenny Rivera, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of them, obviously, she was a celebrity, very big celebrity in Mexico, had a huge following here in the United States as well. At the time of her death, she and her family were actually part of a reality show series talking about Jenny Rivera's life. They finished two seasons of it. Season three was about to start. And in fact, some of the footage of her last concert was from this production. So there was naturally a, an audience there to find out more about what happened to her. And as with most accident investigations, it took several months for the final report to come out. And that several month gap, all sorts of things came out as conspiracy theories from there was something to do with the Mexican drug cartels, to she was trying to escape and have a private life, to insurance fraud, to whatever. But as the facts came out, especially the facts that as we see them in this accident report, most of those conspiracy theories fall away for lack of really plausible evidence. Well, when you think about, you know, the evidence that they had to work with from the investigative standpoint, and this was an investigation that was led by the Mexican government, similar to the FA or the NTSB here in the United States. And in fact, they actually uh, called on the NTSB to assist them in the investigation, utilizing, of course, their resources. Now, one of the things about the old Lear 25s and the Lear 20 series airplanes, um, for those that are old timers, like at least John, the fact is, is that uh, the early series Lear jets had a mock tuck problem. That is that because of the design of the wing, and um, and I'm not going to get into all the aerodynamics for all of those guys out there. They can, they know what I'm talking about or can research it. But the the Learjet was uh, was notorious for getting into mock tuck in the early days. And while this was a uh, later version, Lear 25, 
and there were changes to uh, the mock speed indicator and a variety of other things. You know, again, this airplane is climbing out, going through 28,000 feet, and then goes into a steep vertical nosedive. I mean, we're not talking 45 degrees. We're talking 90 degrees straight down. Now, airplanes don't like to fly like that, that are not designed to be aerobatic or military. They just don't like flying like that. Um, when I did uh, Silk Air, a 737 over in Indonesia, that airplane did strike uh, the water at a very high rate of speed in a near vertical attitude. But it took the pilot pushing the nose over, full nose down, rolling in all the nose down trim and pushing the power up just to keep it there. I can't imagine that if this is an inadvertent act, that is, they lost control for whatever reason, climbing through 28, the nose pitches over and they get into this high speed vertical dive that unless there is a conspiracy <laughs> or some sort of intentional act, these pilots would be trying to recover not keep the nose down and go scream into the ground at you know some very high rate of speed uh to totally obliterate the aircraft on impact and you mentioned conspiracies and most of the theories around how did jenny rivera die most of the conspiracy theories involved somebody making a plan now let's start with the people inside the aircraft did someone inside the aircraft deliberately make this aircraft crash well, here's the thing with that sort of thing. If you do that, you die as well. So was there any evidence that anyone on board this aircraft was suicidal or had a tendency towards suicide, or was any way compromised by anyone on the outside to commit suicide? It was a whole year almost of this accident investigation, and 11 years since this event occurred. Nothing like this has come out, not from any government investigation, not from any civil uh, legal investigation, not from anyone's diary, nothing has come out in this time. Now, what about sabotage from the outside? We know from the accident investigation that there was no evidence of any rapid decompression, fire, or explosion before the aircraft hit the ground. And even if there was something more subtle, let's say you're cutting some wire somewhere, was there any evidence that a maintenance person who had access to the aircraft did something, or that some other outside person came in and did something to the aircraft without the knowledge of everyone else? Again, it's been 11 years several kinds of potential investigations that may have been happening without the public's notice. Nothing has come to light. Todd, when we talk about these conspiracy theories, and of course, there wasn't a lot of wreckage left. In fact, it was pretty much pulverized. You know, of course, the, the concern was that the flight data recorder had been totally destroyed and the cockpit voice recorder supposedly had never been found. Well, <laughs> there's even conspiracy that it may not have ever been on the airplane but when we look at the flight crew and the fact that you got a 78 year old pilot who's in violation of of uh mexican law he should have retired from flying he wasn't qualified to be on the airplane and you have a first officer co-pilot who is 21 years old i mean basically doesn't know anything about flying sitting in the right seat of a lear jet and he is not typed in the airplane if you have any issue that goes on in that airplane, who's going to handle it? Or let's say the captain died right at the controls, had a heart attack, whatever. Who's going to fly? You know, Greg, the, the Learjet's a nice little rocket ship. Pilots love it because it's fast. I mean, you can climb to 40,000 feet and still be over the airport. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's an unbelievable flying airplane. But that high performance comes with high risk. And we've seen it more and more times with, with their pilots. They have the qualifications, but they really don't have all the necessary knowledge to fly that kind of airplane in a performance mode. And, and this is the outcome of all of them. We see it over and over and over again, whether it's a big airplane or a little airplane or something in between. Um, you know, it's just in this particular instance, yes, because there was a famous person on board, it was kind of like, of course, when we um, lost um, a number of other high profile people, you look at Frank Sinatra's mother in a Learjet coming out of Vegas, they run into the side of a mountain. We just did a show not too long ago about Reba McIntyre's band, 
gets killed. You look at Ricky Nelson and all the conspiracy theories about them freebasing and caught the airplane on fire. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. But I guess when you're absent facts, and unfortunately in this particular accident, there were a lot of facts that were absent because you didn't have a lot of physical wreckage. I mean, the, the most common thing to have looked at would have been horizontal stabilizer slash elevator issues because you got to get that airplane into a steep nose low attitude out of control and at a point where the crew can't even attempt to recover it's obvious that there was no attempt to recover now was that because they didn't have control of the elevator horizontal stab or something else took place what else was going on in that airplane or in the conspiracy world, Todd? Um, I know that uh, there was talk about the cartel and possibly somebody shot the aircraft down and a variety of other things. Well, the cartel theory, again, that has a bit of a conspiracy and sabotage as part of it because, well, the cartel might have put a bomb on it. Well, we've already talked about how uh, a direct sabotage of the aircraft, there was no direct evidence of that and no uh, further evidence in the past 11 years. As far as shooting an aircraft down, certainly. There had been cases before this where cartel members or associates had allegedly been trying to acquire service air missiles. But in every one of those cases, these were shoulder-fired type missiles that could not reach up to 27,000 feet. Yeah. And although those systems that can reach into the stratosphere are out there, and certainly these are military-grade weapons, there has been absolutely no indication from any intelligence organization from any military organization that sort of thing is an issue in mexico and, and you would expect i mean and you would expect just like mh17 that was shot down by a shoulder fired or a uh, at least a a fired missile that i mean there is telltale evidence that's you know conspiracy theory that we're still working with tw800 and they didn't shoot it down. There's no physical evidence to support that. So, I mean, that whole theory can be debunked very easily, very quickly. And even that speaks to a conspiracy because uh, the air traffic controllers knew what the aircraft was. Uh, they gave it a clearance, an IFR clearance. And certainly air traffic control radars were picking this up because there's evidence in the report about that. But air traffic control radars are not the same kind of radars you would have in some missile system. And at that distance, it wouldn't be an infrared sort of seeker. I don't want to go into the details of it, but at that altitude, you need something a whole lot more sophisticated than anything that was possibly in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's some even crazier theories with even less backing it up. Things like, well, this is some sort of um, witness protection program thing where some government yeah. agency was trying to hide her. It's like, okay, here's my retort to that. Any witness protection activity that kills six innocent bystanders isn't one that would be tolerated by any number of governments. So anything along those lines, or old yeah. Jenny tried to escape the public eye, you can escape the public eye without being in a plane crash. Uh, you know, and and if I read uh, one of your notes, um, there was talk that she had anticipated or at least planned on buying this particular airplane as her personal aircraft. So. Again, now you think, okay, well, somebody in her entourage and the fact that she's planning to have this airplane because she's going to be traveling a lot, why would you take all of that out of play, especially, you know, you're sacrificing yourself for what good? Nobody came forward. Nobody claimed responsibility for this. Nobody said that any one of the people on the airplane was a martyr and that they were doing it in the name of whoever. So... Um, you know, all of these stories. I mean, I guess when you have famous people and these stories sell and they sell newspapers and magazines and, you know, again, we've seen it sell books and everything else, even though it's been full of falsehoods. So, you know, where do, where do we really go? I mean, the NTSB, you know, put, uh, put their thumbprints all over this and said that a variety of things did not occur as we just talked. There wasn't a lot of wreckage to, to really rule anything more favorable in or out. So I guess this uh, this is one of those accidents where you do have a loss of control. It's obvious the airplane's coming down from 28,000 feet in a nosedive near vertical. The parts, as I recall, Todd, and I think you, you were looking it up, 
um, is that the airplane basically stayed together till it hit the ground. So there isn't anything that would have suggested an in-flight breakup or some kind of external force to tear the airplane apart in the air because we'd expect to see wreckage spread all over the countryside out there as well as the contents of the airplane. So, John, where do they go from here? I mean, I know what the I know what the bottom line of the report says. Something. Well, I know that that well, we both all three of us know that when they're fractured like this, they're very difficult. I have a tough time though uh digesting the fact that they uh couldn't find the reporter. I just it, it doesn't they found the cover for the flight data recorder. Yeah. With no was it was it damaged? Were there witness marks inside the, the cover that indicated that there was something in there? They don't talk about that. They just said yeah. we found the cover. Uh just and given what we know about this operator I would not surprise me at all if there was no flight recorder on there. There was no voice recorder. They're expensive, right? They're expensive. So, and and I just find it difficult that th this operator, you turn a guy loose who's seventy-eight. You know he's in violation of all the <laughs> regulatory requirements to operate. But you pair that 78 year old pilot with a 21 year old who's not qualified, barely understands aviation and you throw him in the right seat. It's like, what were you trying to prove? Were you looking to have an accident? I mean, you know, was it operator set up <laughs> by putting two bad pilots together? And, you know, <laughs> I don't know if they were praying for a bad situation to happen, but again, I mean, all the conspiracy theories, you can you can mount a lot of different storylines, but why would a reasonable person, why would an operator flying somebody, whether, whether it's Jenny Rivera or anybody else, put them on an airplane with two unqualified crew members? Well, let's turn this around a little bit to the two of you who have way more experience in the following areas than I ever had. Now, one of them dealing with operators of these kinds of aircraft, on-demand air taxis and such, and also dealing with celebrities because you two, well, let's just say that you uh, hang around in a different uh, realms than I do. Have you ever been involved? Yeah, in yeah, of... yeah. Wait a minute here. Garth Brooks has sung about the friends we hang with. <laughs> <laughs> Our friends are in very low places, my friend. So <laughs> now, whether low or high, have you ever been around any flight operation or any accident investigation involving either a a lot of circling around uh, conspiracies, or B, famous uh, people with, uh, let's just say, unusual habits that might compromise safety, or they might be hanging around with friends in low places who might do something crazy in the airplane. Any oh, any that, experience have you had that speaks to this? I think, I, think, I think the Ricky Nelson accident was one of those because you got a rock and roll band, basically. And of course, everybody zeroed in on, well, they were free basin and and having a party in the back end of this airplane and, you know, compromise the safety of the of the aircraft and the crew to be able to put the airplane down safely. Um, John, I know that, you know, we we see these things, we hear about these things, we have unruly passengers. Who knows? Um, you, you know, know, you know, I spent some time out west. I, I, I was going to say where, but I, I'll leave the where out. I uh, and before I went to the NTSB, and I met a lot of characters very similar to the characters that are down in uh, Cockroach Corner that we used to call it <laughs> in Miami. Yeah. All right. And uh, Viscounts. There was an operator out in the almost to the west coast that had picked up some Viscounts. Now that was an airplane that was interested. I had an interest in because I worked on those very airplanes way back when. And I went over and they were really not the best airplanes. And I, I would probably wouldn't fly on them. But those would be in on contract to Ray Charles was one of them. Uh, movie stars. The, and talking to the people there, one of the things that was alluded to in that was that these business managers 
make money kickbacks off of buying services of these pretty low uh, on the totem pole operators to fly the music people around, but charging them prices that would go with a high priced airline. So it was only in allegations, you know, multiple allegations, but uh, I don't know that it was ever proven, but it sure would look like it when we see the the quality of some of the airlines that are operators that do crash with with movie stars and and other people of substance on them that it would make sense that somebody was was uh playing financial games with that operation and and you bring up a good point john because we saw that with the crash of a Cessna 402 down in the Bahamas that killed that famous singer, Aaliyah. Um, they overloaded that airplane. They jammed a bunch of stuff in that airplane. It was a low-life low operator. The captain was found to have been on cocaine. I mean, so, you know, your point is well taken. And, you know, again, there is always that possibility. Medical incapacitation in this case, for Jenny Rivera, you got a 78-year-old guy. I mean, we don't know what kind of health he's in. If he dies at the wheel, you got a 21-year-old who has no clue how to operate that airplane. So, I mean, there's there are so many factual things that could happen that could be made into a, uh, a conspiracy theory. Now, another thing about this event, why is there, is there a conspiracy theory about this event with this celebrity? Well, Let's look at the celebrity aspect of it. Clearly, this is an event that had a whole lot of press coverage around North America when it happened, which means there's a huge audience for information about it. You don't have to have a large percentage of a large audience to have a significant number of people who will just eat up any conspiracy theory that's out there. And of course, if uh, some unknown person, even someone who's wealth, wealthy and whatnot, but obviously not famous, what's the audience for that kind of conspiracy theory? Yeah. Well, uh, we'll never know what the uh, the true loss of control was attributed to, but all we know is that we lost a singer and an airplane and a flight crew. And, um, and you know, the question is, where is the safety lesson learned out of this accident? And it's one of those accidents or incidents or intentional acts. We don't know where to classify it that we'll never really learn from. Um, just because we don't have enough information. And I think that, you know, we've talked about this on past shows and it's going to come up again because there's a call by the NTSB to have 25 hour cockpit voice recorders and 25 hour flight data recorders. That's all fine and dandy. But if you have a high speed impact like this and, and let's say the recorders are there, they aren't going to withstand an impact like this. We've all worked accidents where the boxes have failed or have been so destroyed, we couldn't recover data off of them. And maybe it's time again to start looking at ADSB and automatic downloads and aircraft in distress systems that are pumping data, packets of data down so that at least we have something that we can build a factual storyline around in cases like this. We certainly have the technology readily available today to do just that, but we don't have the will to do it. The industry themselves, as soon as you start raising the issue, starts crying about the cost. If you say, all right, we're gonna have newly manufactured airplanes, only start putting them on. And if we had done that 20 years ago, we wouldn't be talking about it today. And uh, the manufacturers don't want any part of it because they think it may impact on their sales. And they, and when they price it, I was involved with the sale of a, a business jet, a new a purchase of a new business jet from a from a neighboring country, and uh, to put the put a, a voice recorder on the in flight recorder on the airplane, uh, exorbitant amount of money to put it on when it already had all the sensors needed on the airplane it was just installing the wire in the box in yeah. and they made it like it was the end of the world to do that well you know and we heard uh since you and i were together the last few days we heard some people even talking about 
the push now to put them, you know, put at least a recording device that is recoverable and can be used on general aviation airplanes. And I'm talking small general aviation airplanes, 172 caliber airplanes, because we are having a lot of accidents where we don't have a lot of factual information in this show that we do every week. We, we just beat up the NTSB for not doing their job because they don't develop all the facts, conditions, and circumstances. That they'll come up with better facts, conditions, and circumstances that support a reasonable, logical, probable cause. Because I'm telling you, I'm, I'm working four new accidents. These reports are atrocious. They have zero fact. They've done zero work. And all they did was mail it in. And it is a disservice to the aviation community and those of us who are looking for lessons learned so that we can reduce the risk and, you know, reduce the accident rate. And without real factual information, leaving it up to the investigators that uh, I've read their reports, they have no business being investigators. So, well... I know that, uh, you know, we will be looking at other accidents, probably similar to, similar to this that are in, that do involve high profile people. Cause, uh, I know that we've researched them and we have them in the queue. Um, we've also gotten some audience requests to do some accidents, which we will do. I think Egypt air was one of them and a few others. So, um, we're going to be, uh, putting those kinds of shows together, but we appreciate the feedback from the audience, giving us suggestions about accidents that uh, they want to hear about. So before I close this out, I will throw it to you, Todd, to the second to the last word for, for tonight. Well, given the subject of this show, talking about conspiracy theories, yes, we don't agree with the conspiracy theories that are out there, but here's one thing I do agree with. Because of the modern communication techniques we have and the internet and social media, at least voices like ours are out there. So yes, there might be a hundred conspiracy videos about, you know, what happened to Jenny Rivera. But if ours is out there, and maybe some other folks are out there who have a more factual bent, maybe this will turn the tide a little bit. I'm hopeful. And John, with yeah. that, I will leave you with our last words. And I am going to go back to my standard one, because I am so frustrated looking at the general aviation accidents. You just touched on it, Greg, with pilots that just don't do the basics and then go out and kill themselves and kill other people. If you're going to go fly in, you've got to do a session of pre-planning. You should do it before you get to the airport. You should redo it when you're at the airport. And when you finish that, you should go out to the airplane and do a real thorough walk around. And I still see people just this morning. I still see people that are not very efficient in what they do. They're just not looking at their airplane. And they get in and, and, you know, light the fire and they're gone. And, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. And then after they get in the air, do you think they're, they're, they're any better at <laughs> looking around and making sure? They're just sitting back. They're all content. We're off the ground now. We're in our little cocoon. They're not paying attention to what's around them. They think air traffic control or, or, or uh, if, they, if they're using it is going to protect them from everything not going to happen and we have enough evidence that we know that it's not going to happen but yet it's just going on and on and some of the, the the real frustrating ones and i know greg you and i were talking about this last week when we were together the the uh the one the airplanes that crash with instructors on board and it's a growing it seems like it's been inching up little yeah. by little by little that should never happen and never and, and uh, most of them are not showing signs of mechanical failures. Yeah. If I, they're looking at people failures. You know, is the, is the instructor got his head someplace else and the student's just flying and all of a sudden the airplane gets away from him and, and it's too far gone for the instructor to recover? I don't know what the outcome is. I just know that there's just too many accidents with an instructor on board. It, it, it needs to be a focused. And... Even with the instructors, are they teaching the right tools? Hmm. We had a we had a long conversation, Greg, with with a uh, with a, an aviation writer about stabilized approaches for general aviation. It's yep. not taught. 
Todd, do they teach you a stabilized approach? As you oh, come back? my instructor is uh, hammering that into me uh, repeatedly. You know, the airspeed, the uh, the RPMs, when to put the flaps up, you know, what uh, speed I should be at certain points in it, and just being consistent in that. And it's making my flying better. And where are you briefing that stabilized approach? Uh, we brief it, uh, you know, afterwards, after I uh, do a lesson stabilized approach. And certainly we go over it beforehand because... Uh, Every uh, time we go out, we're usually shooting at least one approach that's going to be uh, using autopilot, especially. And it's uh, especially important to, again, you know, follow something that could be consistent from approach to approach to approach, not getting used to just going into one approach that I'm familiar with, but being able to have this systematic process where if I have to go to this airport on the spur of the moment, hey, I just do the same things I have done over and over again. And the only well, thing that yeah, might but- be changing is the, is the name. And you would expect that working on an instrument rating or or expecting to fly IFR. But how many general aviation VFR pilots have learned about stabilized approach and adhere to stabilized approach criteria? Speaking as a general aviation pilot who uh, was flying for years before he did any kind of instrument work, I had a, you know, a way of doing approaches. Nowhere near as systematic as what I have now. And even if I'm in a VFR situation, I'm going to use the same sort of rules, same sort of limitations when it comes to an approach. Yeah, so you should. See, you've had some good instructors. Yeah, but but there's a lot out there that that are not, and the FAA is negligent here because they don't require it early enough. That that should be right in the very beginning, and of course I not understand why because you're going to inundate the poor individual with a lot of information, but you've got to build that kind of uh, regiment into their into what they do on a regular basis and not let them go be off the reservation do whatever they want and then all of a sudden two or three years later say oh no we want to change now and do it this way and uh, one of the issues that comes up repeatedly and it's a common issue money it costs money to have an instructor in an airplane well it costs a whole lot less money to go into a ground-based simulator especially one that you can buy for 50 60 bucks put it on your computer and at least have some understanding of the procedures before you get into a more expensive uh, uh, setup. Um, and it costs a whole lot more money if you have an accident. So the big thing is train, 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 get as much out of the training as possible, adhere to all of those, those procedures, those SOPs that you've been taught, even when nobody's looking. Because you know, you just don't know when it's going to save, you know, right on, or you decided, you know what, this approach is out of control. I can't salvage it. I got to get out of here. I'll come back and do it again. You try to salvage a bad situation. That's when the three of us end up going to work. Yes. Yes. All right. So, and final word, just please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, We're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.